Hello and welcome to Dragon Bite, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatric trainees or anyone interested in child health. I'm Asim, one of the paediatric trainees here in Wales. So this is our final episode from the St David's Day conference. In this episode, Stacey and I catch up with Dr Mike Farquhar, sleep consultant at the Evelina Hospital. I catch up with Thomas Cromarty, who's the RCPCH trainee rep for Wales and helped organise the conference. But first up, we have a talk with Max Davey, consultant community paediatrician and officer for health improvement with the Royal College. I discuss screen time with him and the effect that has on child health. Anyway, let's get started. Hi, I'm Asim. I'm one of the paediatric doctors here in Wales. I'm here with uh, Dr. Max Davey, uh, Officer for Health Improvement with the RCPCH. Is that right? Hello, yes, that's yeah. right, I am. <laughs> um, so uh, you did a fantastic talk to us, uh, with us today, about screen time, mm. which I can I just start by saying how, how much more optimistic a talk that was yeah. than I was expecting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I screen time is a part of modern life, and I think modern life, modern life to disagree with Blur from the mid-90s. Modern life is not rubbish. Mm. I mean, modern life has got some difficult aspects to it, but, but we're in a sort of, in many ways, in a, in a real golden, not golden age of childhood, but a childhood which is really exciting and, and full of possibilities. And, and I think the narrative of everything getting worse and everything get, going to hell in a handcart gets applied to childhood mm. almost universally through human history. And I think we need to be very careful about it. Um, when we talk about children. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, you, you raised some really fantastic points there and things that made me question a lot of my own beliefs. Mm. It, it's similar in a way to, you know, pre-H. pylori, everyone was convinced that ulcers were caused by stress and, mm. and then H. H. pylori shows up and we've got a, an answer. Every, I, I was still completely under the apprehension that screen time in all its forms would be detrimental to child's health but actually mm. it seems the data doesn't the data doesn't support it that. and the better the quality of the data the less associations you find mm. um, I think I don't want to give screen time an entirely uh, clean bill of health mm. um, but I think a lot of the causal inferences that being made between screen time and various kinds of ill health are, are not valid mm. um, I do think it can displace health, healthy behaviours. There's no doubt about that. But I think from a health professional's point of view, I think the focus should be on promoting positive behaviours, not necessarily demonising screen time. Hmm. Uh, and, and another important thing that you mentioned, an aspect of screen time, was the fact that not all screen time is equal. In no, the quite. And I think one of the most fascinating bits of the data, and it's only one study, but it, it how actually... You know, rel relatively moderate but, but significant amounts of video gaming does appear to be associated with more positive well-being than no video gaming at all. <laughs> so, so, you know, which, and video gaming is an area where there's some of the moral panic is most prevalent, particularly around the links with um, violence, which mm. have been comprehensively debunked so much so that I don't even put them in my, in my mm. uh, presentation anymore. Um, so, I, so I think, yes, whereas... There are certain forms of, uh, of, of screens that for some people seem to be beneficial. There does seem to be some people, and we don't know who, where certain forms of activity that are accessed through a screen are detrimental, perhaps. So, so the, you know, the, the, the big example of that is social media. And we still, we, obviously we know that bullying can take place through the internet. Mm. Um, there's some evidence that it's more effective that way, as in more harmful that way. But actually, uh, the main... The most important finding about bullying, which I think is probably the most harmful thing you can do with a screen, is mm. be bullied, um, is that the vast majority, about 99% of, of people who are cyber bullied, mm. are also bullied in real life. Mm. So cyber bullying is, is just a form of bullying, and that's not to make it less important, but what we need to tackle is bullying. Mm. That's the key. And you, you also mentioned along the same lines that for some certain subgroups of, of the population, like the LGBTQT mm. plus community, that social media might actually be a source of, 
of benefit. So I think we really need to be very careful about restricting social media access because you will end up with people whose own physical peers and family don't get on with them, who, ha who are therefore excluding them from a community that can, could actually be potentially life-saving, potentially, um, you know, really beneficial. We've got to bear in mind, when we talk about the LGBTQ population, trans kids self-harm in, in their adolescence a phenomenal amount, about half of trans kids will self-harm. Anything that we can do to give them access to helpful people, we should do. Mm. Um, whoever those people are, and if they're online or not offline, not online, I don't think we should necessarily discriminate. So while there are online safety issues, we shouldn't confuse that with kind of pushing for general restrictions. Exactly. Um, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I was just going to, uh, uh, I just want to, I thought it'd be useful for our trainees to get at least um, one practical takeaway message you can give to people about screen time if they, Parents well, are feeling it's impacting. I think you should go to the Royal College website and download our screen time guidance. Mm -hmm. You should just Google RCPCH screen time, it'll come down. And that gives you four questions to ask parents, um, if you've got time to, to listen to those questions. Yeah. Um, so it's, is your family screen time, not your children's screen time, your whole family screen time under control? Does it interfere with your family's activities, the things you want to do? Is it interfering with sleep? And are you in control of snacks during screen time? If you can answer those questions positively, you're fine. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank all you right. very much. No problem at all. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Next up, we have Dr. Michael Farquhar, consultant in sleep medicine at the Evelina Hospital in London. Stacey and I caught up with him following a brief but intensely illuminating talk about sleep to learn more about sleep and its impact on patients and health professionals. Uh, so thank you very much, Michael Farquhar, um, your consultant in sleep. A right? consultant in sleep medicine at Evelyn London Children's Hospital, yes, thank yeah. you. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Mm -hmm. um, it really m sort of made me realise the importance of sleep that I had I had known that it was important, but not quite, quite as important as you've made it uh, clear to me. I think that's one of the things is we are all very used at pretending to ourselves that sleep is something that we can cut down and skim for and everything will be fine and because on a day-to-day -day basis you know if you get six hours of sleep and you're meant to get seven you still function the next day but it's the long-term impact of that that is the issue so, yeah so i think you are certainly not alone in that mm. um so that was going to be my first question why is sleep important so as i said in the talk that lots of reasons why sleep is important but for me the the best way of thinking about it is sleep as essential maintenance for your brain and body every night of your life so it's the equivalent of an mot for a car that every night of your life. Mm. And if you skimp on regular maintenance, things don't work as well as you should do. And with sleep, if you're not getting that right amount of good quality of sleep, can, you know, roughly consistently, it doesn't need to be absolutely straight jacketed, then you will begin to see consequences of that. Um, but a lot of the time, we don't let ourselves see the consequences of being sleep deprived, and we just carry on and carry on and carry on. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's something that I've come to realise more uh, recently is, yeah, I've realised that a lot of a lot of the, my problems or, uh, yeah. you know, when I don't feel quite right, it's probably because I haven't had enough sleep the yeah. night before. I mean, it is, if you look at, you know, it's one of those uh, meme things that people see about sleep. You know, if you had a drug that did all the things for you that sleep actually does, mm. it would be hailed as this amazing new miracle mm. drug that just does everything. Um, but because it's sleep and we've all just normalised not getting the right amount of sleep, we don't think about it mm -hmm. in the same way. Yeah. Amazing. So you talked about the, sl the link between um, sleep and obesity. Can you just go into that a little bit more? So it's one of these things that's probably a little bit difficult to be absolutely sure what's going on there. So we know that there is a correlation between sleep deprivation and obesity. So if you are getting significantly less sleep than you should be getting, you are also significantly more likely to be obese. Historically, we've always kind of looked at that as a, you know, if you are carrying a lot of extra weight, you are much more likely to have problems with your breathing in sleep, so to have obstructive sleep apnea. But over the last 10, 15, 20 years, what we started to do is look at that the other way around and say, well, actually, maybe the, the link goes the other way. There was a little bit where it looked like some of that might be mediated by uh, the way that sleep deprivation affects uh, hormones like leptin and ghrelin that regulate our appetite and hunger. And the evidence is not absolutely convincing on that. It may be something as simple as if you are spending more time awake, 
it is normal uh, for you to end up spending more time snacking. So if you awake longer, you eat longer, yeah, you sure. put on weight more. Yeah. There is a definite, uh, and this is where I do a lot of work uh, in shift work. Um, so people who work night shifts are very familiar usually with the middle of the night munchies. So there's a definite effect of sleep deprivation um, and fatigue on appetite and hunger. And we also see that clinically. So we look after children with narcolepsy, for example, which is an illness where sleep regulation goes off the rails. And in the period of time where they have become more sleepy in the daytime than we would expect them to, they've usually also gained a significant proportion of weight for no other obvious reason. So there is a relationship between sleep and weight. And we think that the, there is certainly enough evidence to suggest that thinking about optimising sleep should be a protective risk factor against developing obesity, but the exact relationship continues to be explored. God, it's so interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, think so. I'm uh, budding. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so I was wondering if you had a top five facts about sleep. Top five facts <laughs> about sleep? It's a bit of a sleep. difficult one. Um, depends what you approach it from. There's, so one of the reasons I love sleep, first of all, is that it um, crosses cultures. And although there is a physiology to sleep, there is also a degree of cultural influence on what constitutes normal sleep. Um, so a really good paediatric example of that is that in this country, we very much say that children should not co-sleep with parents. And, and that's true particularly for babies and, and you know, risk of uh, some infant death. Um, but in other cultures, co-sleeping is very normal. And there are, it's a very complex issue. And there's lots of other things going on about why it's safe in inverted commas in one culture and not safe in another. There's, there's lots of factors behind for that. But it's a very big difference, and in the respective cultures, both are normal. There's a lot of variation around that. Um, it then starts to get, um, for me, uh, even more interesting in that when sleep doesn't go right, we tend to come up with explanations for it. So um, there is a phenomenon called sleep paralysis. So one of my five facts about sleep. When you are dreaming, you are effectively paralysed, because if you weren't, you would be acting out your dreams, and that would put you at risk of injury and harm and all the rest of it. So every night when you dream, you are paralysed. Your body loses tone um, to stop you acting out your dreams. Um, most people, at least once or twice in their life, will have the experience of waking up and feeling like they can't move. They feel like they've got a tight band or a heavy weight on their chest. They can't move, and that's sleep paralysis. And all that is, is just persistence of that paralysis into the waking state a little bit longer. You then track that back through cultures, and you know, so in medieval times, that was interpreted as evil demons that were coming in the middle of the night and doing horrible things to you. Um, I think in modern culture, that probably explains things like alien abduction stories and that kind of thing. It's often accompanied by very vivid dreamlike uh, imagery in the room around you. Um, so it's that kind of the interface between the, the kind of society, the social elements of sleep, the science of sleep, and then stories. We tell stories about lots of things. It's fascinating. There are a number of paintings, aren't there, mm. of, of sleep yeah, paralysis yeah, in that form of yeah. demons so, sitting on, on um, the chest. The, there's some very famous ones, mm. and the, the kind of the classic original idea, I know it's a bit tricky to track it back, but one of the ideas for the original etiology of the word nightmare mm. um, comes back to that, um, where you know something was pressing on your chest and doing mm. it. People often mix up, so sleep paralysis comes from dreams, and nightmares also come from dream sleep, but there are lots of uh, normal things that go on, particularly in children. So sleep terrors, for example, horrible to see, it looks like your child's being possessed by a devil, all the rest of it, they look like they're terrified. And parents often misinterpret that and think, oh, they're having a really bad dream. But actually those come from a completely different stage of sleep, they're coming from deep sleep. And you can kind of track the physiology through and explain it all in that way, but yeah, the, how people interpret what's going on is really interesting. Mm -hmm. That wasn't five, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, there was one that I picked up from you that um, was uh, sort of what normal sleep was, so yeah. that we shouldn't really expect children to stay asleep for a long period of time because they, um, you know, they're having the different cycles and it's normal to wake up. Yeah, so, and, and that's not just children. So mm -hmm. the idea of normal sleep is really tricky, uh, and that's probably one of the biggest myths about sleep is, you know, you read all the articles in the newspapers and everyone's looking for that magic. X number of hours that you need to get to get the right amount of sleep. Um, as you heard in the talk, um, the way that I encourage people to think about that, so particularly for paediatricians, is um, we are very used to thinking about biological variables in children as continual variation. So height. You know, if you say how tall should a 14-year-old boy be, there isn't a right answer to that. There's a range of normal. But people expect there to be a single number right answer for sleep. And that causes a lot of problems because when people get very fixed on that number. If you say the right answer for that is nine and a half hours, but your 14 year old actually is fine with eight hours, then you just create a lot of additional stress and pressure about the wrong idea. Equally, 
if you are somebody who needs to get 10 hours of sleep and you're getting the magic eight, you're still two hours sleep deprived every night. And again, that often causes issues. So understanding normal variation in sleep is really important. And, and it's very much about thinking about ranges rather than fixed numbers. And the second point, as you said, is that waking up is normal, not just for children, for everybody. And so adults wake um, multiple times through the night, settle back into sleep, won't remember they've been awake. Um, and again, that's a normal part of the way sleep biology works. Um, but if you don't understand that, the parents who've got the child that wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning think something is wrong, when actually probably the waking up is normal. The question is usually why they've not settled back to sleep. And often it's something as simple as they've fallen asleep with a dummy and then the dummy's fallen out and the dummy's not there, they don't go back to sleep. Um, but yeah, the more you understand the normal, the more you can understand what's happening when things go wrong or seem to go wrong. Um, so I've, de uh, yeah, I've decided that I would really like to find out some, mm. more, uh, some more about sleep. Mm. Um, there, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk um, a course by one of your colleagues, I think. Cathy Hill. Yeah, Cathy Hill. Um, so Cathy Hill is a paediatric sleep consultant at Southampton Children's Hospital. Um, and like all of us, she does her best to try and uh, teach people all the stuff that we think people should know. So her team run a couple of different courses. They do, I think they do a one day course and then they do a two day course um, that's designed to give people um, some more information about sleep. So obviously people who go on the one day course just need enough to, you know, they may be just something more special. The two day course is meant to be giving a much more in depth uh, look at sleep difficulties and how to, to treat them. But yeah, it's a brilliant course um, and uh, I think it's, you know, people are interested. I would absolutely recommend it. Do you ha are there any other resources that you could recommend? I know you've done quite a few papers, haven't you? So we've, our department yeah. has done, so we've done uh, a few articles over the last few years. So we've got one, um, so a couple of them are the archives, uh, education and practice edition, 15 minute consult kind mm -hmm. of articles. So we've got one on sleep problems in the healthy child mm -hmm. uh, that Jess Turnbull and I wrote. Uh, we've got one on sleep difficulties in the context of children with ADHD, uh, which Max Davy, who also spoke today, uh, Sally Hobson and I wrote, and then, uh, in BMJ Pediatric Open, um, another of my colleagues, Desmond Joseph, and one of our neurodisability consultants, Ethan McDonald, have written one for uh, sleep difficulties in the context of neurodisability. Um, and all three of those articles are intended to give people basic practical tips about what to do for sleep difficulties and what you can do. We're in the process, uh, so Nick Schindler and I are in the process of writing one for adolescents, which is a group of uh, young people who get a really hard deal when it comes to sleep. Mm. Well, brilliant, thank you. Uh, one last thing, mm. if, if it's all right with you. Uh, I was just so interested in getting your your thoughts on um, some re sort of changes in perspective, particularly mm. when it comes to the trainee charter and mm. uh, sleep during work. Because I remember even the, in the brief time I've been qualified, um, when I initially started in foundation year, if I if I wasn't seeing a patient during a night shift, I should be at the computer doing yeah, discharge summaries, working yeah. away, not getting yeah. any rest. But it seems to be slowly an ongoing shift into, actually, if you can get some rest. Yeah. So there is. You. You've done a lot of work, uh, haven't yeah. you? <laughs> a lot of that started with, uh, mm. so it's now happening on multiple fronts, which is brilliant. But yeah, so within paediatrics, especially, um, that started as a piece of work at Evelina London uh, mm. about six or seven years ago when I became a consultant. It then spread, so uh, at the time uh, Camilla Kingdon, who's now the Vice President of the College, was uh, the head of the London School of Paediatrics. Mm -hmm. So she became aware that we were doing this within the Evelina and we then started spreading that through the London School mm. and then the College became aware that the London School were doing it and then it kind of spread from there. Um, the fundamental point about that is that you are not evolved to be uh, awake at night time, you are not evolved to be asleep in the daytime. So asking somebody to work at night particularly about three, four o'clock in the morning when your body is at its absolute low point, is profoundly unphysiological. And it's not possible to sustain functional performance in any way, shape or form. So we should be putting in place as many things as we can to mitigate the risks, both to people who are working those shifts, which are not insignificant, but also the fact that if you've got a tired doctor at three o'clock in the morning, the care that they're delivering is also not what it should be. So the patients are also at risk. And part of that, yes, is that there is a role for using short planned naps, and we're talking 15 to 20 minute power naps, not long periods of sleep in the night shift. But many people find that a short planned nap helps to offset that and helps them function better. What that then becomes is a conversation with, uh, so th the college has been hugely supportive of this, but it becomes a conversation with big organisations, with chairs, with chief execs, with medical directors to say, that idea that you are not paid to sleep on night shift, the physiology about that is completely wrong. And if you say that, you are telling me you don't understand the basic biology. Here is some information about basic biology. What are you going to do about it? And we are beginning to see a big change. So 
Um, the anaesthetic colleges in particular have done a huge amount around this. Um, the BMA has done work around this, the Fatigue and Facilities Charter, which actually, so we're sitting in Cardiff, and so the Welsh Government became the first uh, government level organisation in the UK to sign up uh, to the Charter as a whole, which is great. I think they're still putting that into place practically, but mm. you know, they're, at least they're signed up to principles. Um, and we're working with the Academy of, Medical Royal, Academy of Medical Royal Colleges to get a kind of consensus statement of that level coming out fairly soon as well. So it's coming, but it's you know it's like turning around a super tanker. You know the NHS has worked in this way for a very long time, and everybody just kind of accepted that that was a rubbish part of the job. We are trying to change that impression and make things hopefully a little bit better. Excellent. Thank you for all your work. You're very welcome. Yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Finally, to round off the St. David's Day Conference podcast, I caught up with Thomas Cromarty. Tom is the RCPCH Trainee Representative for Wales, a fellow local trainee rep, and has a finger in pretty much every pie in Wales, including Dragon Bites for that matter. He's presented for us before and hopefully he'll be hosting for us again soon. He worked hard to organise the conference and I wanted to chat to him about how he went about doing that. All right, so uh, I'm, I'm here now with Tom Crom, who organised today's event. Tom, so can you tell me a bit about what today was all about and what inspired you to get the speakers we've got today? Sure. Um, so I, I wanted something that resonated for trainees and consultants and for just healthcare who, who deal with paediatrics generally. Um, and so I put together a little kind of survey, really, asking, asking uh, trainees what they wanted and what kind of themes would work. And actually, the one that came out the top was was health promotion, and kind of selfishly, that's one I actually wanted as well because it's something that I'm really interested in, and it was an excuse for me to really uh, contact lots of these presenters, whether it is on Twitter or by email or just by friends, um, and get these amazing speakers to come for the day. Um, and I'm really pleased that really they're able to just get some of that time and come across from London and Oxford and all over Wales. Um, so yeah, I suppose it was more of a selfish uh, <laughs> venture to try and get these amazing talk speaks down. Well, a selfish venture, but backed up by a survey of everyone. So that's exactly, pretty yeah, fair. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it must have been a lot of effort to organise all of this. Um, uh, who, who else was involved alongside you? I mean, there's probably a few think people who, who helped out getting a lot of this organised, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, so... I think when we had a few of ideas of some of the topics that would be talked about, I kind of just went to people that I know, f and fr from the last few years, I, you know, I, I've met a few people in different um, uh, different parts of the country at conferences, and and so there is a kind of a wider network of people that I know. Just ask them, really, and they were able to suggest people, um, and so that was really just getting the speakers, and then really from an admin side of things it was just me and, and Lisa one of the the ladies that works in the Royal College and and so we just it has been a lot of work um, uh, contacting people getting the presentations ready making them make sure that they were ready to go on for the day uh, last minute adjustments the coronavirus had its play because a lot of the public health Wales speakers had to um, send other people in their place because they had to go to like an emergency meeting this afternoon um, to sort out, you know, all the various calls that they're now really inundated with. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a lot of work, but having seen, you know, the speakers throughout the day and the, just the reactions that people have given me, um, you know, immediately afterwards I was thinking never again, but now I'm thinking I can't wait to see what we could do next time. Amazing. Yeah. Right, um, well, thank you, Tom. Welcome. It was, it's, it's been a brilliant day. Welcome. It was great. I've enjoyed it. So that's it for our St. David's Day conference interviews. I just wanted to say a final thank you to all the speakers who took time out of their day at the conference just to discuss their talks with us here at Dragon Bites. So, like everyone else, Dragon Bites is going to change how it operates over the coming months given the current COVID situation. Though we have some of our normal episodes recorded and planned to be released over the next two weeks, future episodes are probably going to become more infrequent. However, given that everyone has had their study days cancelled across the country and we don't want trainees missing out on teaching, we'll endeavour to keep podcasts coming to you as often as we can. Perhaps this can be our little contribution to maintaining a semblance of normality over what will inevitably be a challenging time ahead of us.
for next week, we're going to be having the first of our cardiology teaching series. Professor Orhan Uzun, fetal cardiology lead at the University Hospital of Wales, will be joining us to discuss Tetralogy of Fallow. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening to Dragon Bites. Thank you.